Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome. My name is uh, Dr. Una Osili, Associate Dean for Research at the Lilly Family School and also the Dean's Fellow at the Mays Family Institute, also here at Indiana University. I am so honored and delighted to welcome Philip Yun to our Mays Family Institute webinar today. It is truly a pleasure to welcome him formally to Indiana University and to the Lilly Family School and to the Mays Family Institute. He is no stranger to philanthropy, has spent several decades uh, doing this work, but today we're going to cover a most uh, welcome and relevant topic in a world that is truly global. There are many challenges that affect us all, and he is leading an organization that's at the front lines of these changes. And so I'll share his brief bio and then we're going to open the floor and ask all of you to join us with your questions, but also give Philip a chance to share his story. So I'll start with his bio and also use this opportunity to thank his colleagues at the Global Philanthropy Forum and the World um, Council for all their support. So Philip Yun is president and CEO of World Affairs and previously was the executive director and chief operating officer at Shares Fund. Prior to joining the fund, he was a vice president at the Asia Foundation and was also a scholar in Korean studies at the Asia Pacific Research Center. Uh, uh, there's, he has a tremendous background in private equity, but also served as presidential appointee to the U.S. State Department, serving as a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and worked as a senior advisor to two coordinators for North Korea policy. He has had a long career in government, in philanthropy, and in the private sector. And prior to his government service, worked as an attorney, a practicing lawyer at the firms of Pillsbury Madison and Sutro in San Francisco. His writing and commentary have appeared on so many forums, too many to list, but including CNN, The Hill, Foreign Policy, NBC US News and World Report and the Los Angeles Times. He's the co-editor of a book titled North Korea and Beyond. So his accomplishments are lengthy. His resume is impressive, but more importantly, he's a wonderful human and world um, leader at the world stage. So we're just delighted to have him here with us virtually. And we hope that he can at some point also come in person uh, to visit the school and spend some time with us. So at this point, welcome formally. And I think we have lots of folks who will be joining, some already on the webinar and some will be uh, joining later. So thank you for having uh, for being with us today. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to the Lilly family, the school family, and the uh, Mays Family Institute. Um, you know, I just want to say, uh, you know, you were just so tremendous uh, at the Global Philanthropy Forum earlier, I mean, last year in November. So I'm more than happy and glad that I can uh, join you here uh, 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 with your with your institute. And, you know, I just got to say, you know, um, the program at Indiana University is just awesome. I mean, um, I got my, my introduction into to fundraising from you all. And to the extent that I have any expertise and any success in fundraising, I have to say that it was because of the programs that I did with all of you. So I just wanted to thank you so much for uh, for what you do and, and what the institutes do. Fantastic. Well, thank you. We will take that uh, appreciation and gratitude and also say that uh, we're glad that it's been useful and that you're, you're able to apply it in your everyday work. So tell us about your journey. You've worked in government, you've worked in the private sector, also in philanthropy. What are the kind of values and um, maybe the vision that you had at the beginning that connected you to this work and what propelled you to take the, the leadership role that you have now at the World um, Council, World Affairs Council, and also the Global Philanthropy Forum, two different organizations, but you're yeah. still a CEO. Yeah, so for me personally, if I had to think about the things that have driven me, it's always been, um, you know, it's been about uh, public service. Right, um, and it's always this desire to, to to make a difference, and so I have that. And the other common thread has been Asia. So from that standpoint, um, you know, it seemed natural for me to be doing what I am right now, 
which is, you know, involved in uh, global issues and philanthropy. Um, I look at philanthropy really as another form of public service. And to me, it's more important than ever because, you know, when we look at our, you know, and what's compelled me to do what I'm doing right now is just kind of the world we live in. I mean, you know, the recent events, uh, you know, COVID, uh, you know, the uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, even the Russian invasion. I mean, if, 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 if it wasn't apparent to people 10 years ago, and this is what I was arguing back then, um, it's apparent now that the world has completely changed. And we're in a completely new era. And the one thing I keep on thinking about, it's that it's no longer business as usual. And what I'm seeing is these days even more constant change. Um, you know, like the weather here in San Francisco that we've had for the last uh, couple of months, more intense, more frequent, greater, and, and uh, um, you know, more constant. And um, I just see so much stress in the world. And I see that the world's institutions are not being able to meet that. And I see a whole bunch of uncertainty. And I just see this notion that, um, you know, philanthropy has to help fill that gap. So this is kind of what I've been, been thinking about. Um, and, you know, uh, and I've also been thinking about um, what, it, what it means for philanthropy and what we need to be doing. And, you know, the problems right now, uh, philanthropy, I, I looked at it, used to be filling in gaps to some degree where government and the private sector and individuals to deal with the demands of their, their everyday existence just uh, was they weren't able to fill that. So civil society and philanthropy did that. But now it's, things are happening way too fast. And um, I feel now philanthropy has to be a driving partner um, into what we need to be doing. And so, uh, you know, I just see the, the safety nets that exist are smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer. And, you know, that's what's driving me even more so. Um, I just see philanthropy as a huge, huge piece of what it is that we need to be doing in this world right now. That is um, just amazing, given the unique role that you occupy right now, you're able to see things at a global scale. No, we um, certainly need that global perspective right now. You mentioned Asia has been a common thread in a lot of your work. Can you share uh, just a little bit about what that means in this particular moment that we're in? Do you have some unique insights that you're bringing from your work in government or in the private sector or at the Asia Foundation? Well, you know, for me, it's, I, for me, the unique perspective that I have is that I have worked in government, I've worked in the private sector, both as in law and in finance. Um, I've been in diplomacy, I've worked in Asia, I've been in nonprofits, I've been a funder, I've been a, um, uh, a grantee. Um, and so for me, I, I think that the world is no, because of globalization, and you can argue now regionalization, um, we've got too many problems and things are happening too quickly uh, for any one sector to respond. I mean, you know, in the old world, government did their thing, um, private sector did their thing, and philanthropy kind of filled in sort of the gaps. You know, that doesn't work anymore. And so what I see is, you know, this overlap of the three. If we want to solve really big problems and deal with them, we need all three sort of sectors putting things together. And, and making it work. And so that's where I see in philanthropy as a, you know, just sort of a, a, a not only intellectual, but a passion, is that all three of that, the, the area where they all overlap, that's where um, the solutions are going to be found. And I, and I don't know if it's necessarily Asia per se, um, but, you know, for me, I see that it's going to require all three to work very carefully together. And that's the area of experimentation that is happening now that I'm very excited about. And we can talk a little bit more why I think experimentation is absolutely critical these days. But um, that's the big thing that I see. And usually what has happened up to this point is people were, would come into this with only one perspective. Um, for a long time, there were very few of me who had all three or four different perspectives, and what we did was translate. And to some degree, I still do that. 
Um, but the good news for me is that there are more and more people who have hopped around and are getting involved. So there's a lot of interesting work that's going on in the overlap to solve really big problems. And quite frankly, given where we are right now, where the world is changing <clears throat> so quickly, um, that's the only way we're going to do anything and get anything done. Fantastic. So I heard you say it's not business as usual. We've all kind of gotten used to thinking that we can't go back to where things were. We're going to have yeah. to come up with new approaches. And so one thing that I certainly learned from you in our many conversations is this is the time to be bold. If yes. you weren't a bold thinker, this is the time because there isn't necessarily a template for solving these global problems. But also uh, bold philanthropy means addressing challenges and doing it differently. And that may mean uh, for many funders taking a new approach, an equity yes. approach, looking at who's been left behind, who's not at the table, and who hasn't been a part of decision making. This is especially true when we look at uh, another facet in the global philanthropy landscape is around localization. How do we bring local voices to the table, um, groups that have been historically marginalized? And philanthropy at this moment is seeking to engage grassroots organizations in a way that it hasn't before. Uh, we've even heard funders, government funders, thinking about how do they engage more local voices, uh, everyone from uh, Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, uh, Samantha Power at USAID, and so forth. How can funders, and this is your chance to sort of share your thoughts on this, right. please shift models. This is both domestic and at the global level to start to engage communities and democratize decision-making. It's, it's a new way of doing things for many funders. Uh, what are you learning in this moment and what is working for funders? So you know, let me let me step back a little bit. Maybe it might be it, you know good for people to understand how I look at philanthropy in general. And very quickly, I, you know, I look at uh, you know to do anything right, you got to identify solutions that actually work. Then you've got to create a platform for people who want to act to actually be able to make that impact. Okay. And the third element that is a really big thing for me that I think we'll have the opportunity to talk about is I think the ability or the way to get people to actually do something. And quite frankly, the way I think that's gonna happen, and my view is that it's all about narrative and um, a way to get people to connect with their hearts and move. And I think that's a huge gap in philanthropy in general. Um, and so right now, you know, the big thing, so if you, if you look at those three things, you then gotta decide how do you wanna give your money away? Right? And there's some areas where I know that you all have you've done studies and, and looked at this. I, I kind of divide the way you invest in these different areas and whatever is through what I think is, you know, um, urgent needs, like basically an advocacy campaign or, you know, collecting money or there's an urgent issue that you have to deal with. There's a whole new notion of capacity building, which is to keep people, you know, in the game, right? Because people need, you need expertise and know-how. And then the big thing that I think for this time right now, which is absolutely critical, is this whole notion of venture funding, uh, finding new players and new ideas to encourage competition and different perspective. That being said, um, the, the general categories that we're looking at in terms of changing the status quo is I think philanthropy needs a new value system. I think there are new ways of operations and mechanics in philanthropy that are really important. I talked about the power of narrative. Uh, what you alluded to is my notion of, I want to double down and we will like the global philanthropy forum is the whole notion you know, of, uh, of, of DEI, right? But to me, DEI has evolved to really not necessarily equity as much as justice. I think there's a difference between the two. And then ultimately changing the mindset of donors uh, particularly private sector donors. So with, with that as context, um, you know, I think the key role of, as I mentioned before, I think the key role of, uh, uh, of philanthropy now in this time is to foster innovation, make risky investments that government and the private sector and more traditional civil society is not going to be able to do or won't do. And as we talked about, I think that means radical, bold, 
um, serial experimentation. And so, you know, we have seen a bunch of different models here at GPF. Uh, this past year, we had this organization called, I think it was the Green Africa Youth Organization that talked about their model of participatory uh, philanthropy that allows for people on the ground who understand the problems better to actually do something about that. Um, and, you know, it is all about the idea that people who are there know better than all of us, um, you know, who are giving the money away. And I'm a firm believer in bottom up. I think bottom up is the only way we can go right now in this circumstance, um, in the times that we live in. Uh, we also know about this organization called the Black Feminist Fund. Um, they had this amazing open letter in the uh, open letter about finding social movements. And I think uh, another organization that was a participant in GPF uh, before was the Catali uh, uh, Foundation. And they are, are about seven year block grants for a period of time and rapid response. And this is all about understanding that people on the ground are gonna be the ones to know their problems better. And, you know, we have to realize that as funders, you know, this is about trust more than anything else, right? Um, and to, to, to allow people to, to do what they need to do and, and get out of the way. Excellent. So I, I've taken away lots of uh, examples, lots of ideas around what bold philanthropy means right now. And along those same lines, when we talk about equity, I, yeah. I know you said we need to move away from equity and talk about justice um, instead, but that's going to look different in every community, especially yes. on a global scale. And yeah. since we, um, with our global philanthropy indices, we are learning every day that uh, what works in one region may not work in another region. Something that resonates here may or may not work in another country. However, there are certainly lessons that uh, people, folks in philanthropy in the nonprofit sector are willing to and eager to learn from their neighbors in other countries, other regions. So when we start thinking about equity and justice, what does that look like at a global scale? And then um, at, as we tailor these kinds of concepts to different countries and communities, I guess the qu specific question for you is, what role can philanthropy play in addressing inequity when there are so many other players, yeah. government, the private sector? And how have you seen funders really engage in this work um, in a way that is really yeah. transformational? So, you know, I, I think one of the things that you hit on that's really important is that every country, every community within the country is different. And that's why we have this argument of why it makes complete sense to listen to the people who are there. They've got the better ideas. I mean, you know, philanthropies in general have these theories of change. They have theory, it's top down, but you know what? Theories always change, right? Uh, and I am one of the firm believers of local experience, practical, tried and true, trial and error, years of experience are gonna trump theory. Um, and Elijah's I think theory, the way it usually works is not these days in particular where, you know, um, uh, change is happening so quickly. Theory is based on past, right? But a lot of things that all the rules that happened in the past and business as usual don't apply to the future, right? So that's why you've got to talk with people who are seeing what's on the ground who have this ability to iterate. I think the larger question is, you know, and I'm going to quote, um, you know, I want to step back, you know, use this global perspective about the nature of the problem that we all face as a community. And I've been thinking about this a lot in, in how we do this in, in different ways. You know, um, Mark Alec Brown, who's the, you know, the, the who leads the uh, Open Society Foundation, wrote a book uh, several years ago. He was on the on GPF and I read his book that he wrote almost 15 years ago. And he had a couple of really amazing quotes from me that I think I'm gonna see if I can find and read for us. Um, two things. So he said, going in the future, and this still applies to earlier, the overarching conflict facing the people of planet Earth for the foreseeable future is between the forces of international cooperation and the forces of nationalism. 
Okay. Now we saw that with COVID, right? You know, um, and how different countries react, whether we do it jointly or whether we have a, a specific, you know, national approach to what happens, right? Um, and, you know, what's really interesting is that, and this is critical, is those are the players involved. You know, those are the two, 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 two uh, uh, opposing forces, okay? Now, the other thing that he said that I thought was really quite um, insightful, you know, and really applies to the larger circumstance that we all face, and then we can talk about philanthropy, is that sustaining the world's ability to absorb new people. Now, remember, our world is going to increase, what, our population is about 6 billion, it's going to go up to 10 billion in the next, 50, you know, 30, 40 years, right? Our, the challenge that we face is sustaining the world's ability to absorb new people, and the ones in difficult circumstance in the world and provide them with a decent life, all right? Now, the interesting thing is this ultimately is, the, is a political issue and is the political issue of our time. So what Mark Malik Brown has talked about is the nature and scope of the actual substantive policy battle that goes on, all right? Now, the insight in all this is that it is essentially a political problem, all right? So I talked about, and, and you know, I talked about how philanthropy can sort of put in there. How do we figure out a way to push ways to fill this particular gap, okay? And for me, when I think about what this means and what we can be doing, you know, we talk about creating a platform for, you know, we identify solutions that work, as I said before. We create a platform for people who want to act that can actually do something. And then what we do is we create a narrative and stories to get people to act. That's how people act. And for me, when I look at philanthropy, you know, as I said, philanthropy allows people to take risks that others cannot or will not. And so it's just, to me, a matter of will. So how do you do that, right? If philanthropy doesn't fund civil society, who will? And that happens on a global basis. So when I think about that, um, in terms of the, the global perspective, um, I want to just say I think narratives are really important. I think narratives can change the world, and it can be done on a smaller scale that I think philanthropies and nonprofits can work on. It can be on a larger scale, and I think there are a lot of foundations now that are realizing the importance of this. Uh, Serdano, Luce, and others are thinking about how to address equity, justice through narratives, right? Because you've got to have hearts and minds. People often know <laughs> discrimination is bad, right? They know that people are poor, but you know what? As we found, found in the United States, facts sometimes don't matter. So what you got to do is you got to go with hearts and minds. And I think one great um, uh, example of that is marriage equality. To change the narrative of what it means, things happen. I think um, you know philanthropy itself if you step back, is a history or the, 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 the origins of philanthropy, at least in the United States, is predominantly um, inherited wealth and until relatively recently, white people. And so the values in that system, okay, are those values and they have to change. So um, the way I would look at it then is, you know, um, you know, in equity, it is all about local. It's about combining and curating and co-creating and working with people on the ground. Um, you know, a couple of great examples that I would say is Common Future. Um, there's the organization called the um, Appalachia Common Fund, which tries to deal with equity in a lot of different ways. And on a global scale, there's One Earth. Now, uh, One Earth, uh, we did some stuff with GPF. Uh, they are doing this thing on... Um, uh, there was a, a, a study by Drawdown that talked about a comprehensive guide to addressing climate change. It was really interesting. It talked about global equity, and it looked at um, climate change through the lens of educating girls. And so to give you an example, GPF 2022, we had this woman, um, Namonti Nenkioma, I think Climo, who is of the uh, Wararani tribe in Ecuador. Um, and she was able to get through her advocacy and support of folks, particularly One Earth and others, 
to get the, uh, you know, ec uh, uh, organize the uh, Ecuadorian Amazonic communities to um, preserve and protect half a million acre, half a million acres, I believe it is, of the uh, Amazon forest. So, you know, to me, these are the things that are happening in equity, which is uh, just, you know, doing things that are local, getting people to be part of this decision-making process and, and moving forward. And as I said, this is a political problem. Um, and, you know, I think that people often shy away from politics because they think it's partisan. It doesn't have to be partisan. It can be advocacy, right? You can be nonpartisan, but have a point of view. And that's something that I want to emphasize the folks. Fantastic. So the thread I'm taking away here is that uh, certainly this is the time to rethink the way we've done things. But also, I, I want to stress for everyone who's joining us um, here at the Lilly Family School, we think of philanthropy quite differently from how everybody perhaps uh, does, because the definition we use certainly is the idea of private action for public good. And when we look historically, people of all backgrounds have participated. But I love the idea that you have brought to the table, which is this is the time to experiment. Yes. There isn't necessarily a playbook. And your experience specifically in venture philanthropy yeah. prepares you to think perhaps yeah. very differently. And you've learned some important lessons from how venture capitalists approach solving problems, their willingness to try new things, to take risks, to take um, sort of the long view in some cases. What are the sort of benefits you see right now and sort of lessons we can learn from venture capital models, but also talk to us about the limitations, uh, especially in philanthropy. Where does this have some sort of question marks for you? So let me be clear. I don't think venture um, is the answer all the time. I just think that venture right now or the approach that it encompasses is right for this time right now. Um, taking a page from, you know, my private sector days, you know, the, the kind of president or leader you want for a startup and the, the, the demands that a startup company has, and I'm going from my private sector background, is very different from the demands that a CEO of a Fortune 500 company that's completely mature has as well. So those are two completely different personalities for potentially the same company, but at different times. And it's in its life. So, in my view, you know, um, what has happened in the past, quite frankly, I don't think is going to be so relevant going into the future. I kind of, I kind of think about this whole notion that a turkey thinks everything is great until Thanksgiving Day, right? That's kind of what what I think about. We're going into the world. I believe is in the midst of trying to find a new operating system. You know, everyone's questioning democracy, they're questioning capitalism, they're questioning all these things, right? Um, you know, before, you know, communism, fascism died, now things are coming back again. We are making things up. We are building the plane as we are flying and it is evolving. We don't know what it is, all right? So for me, I, you know, I don't know what the future is going to bring. I don't know. So what's great about this sort of venture approach that I see, which is essentially many small bets, many small bets, okay, that you make with the highest potential returns. I think you bet on people, right? Um, so the thing about this is if you don't know what's happening and you can't, and I think prediction models are work until they don't. And I don't think they're going to be working. You know, we just saw recently the elections, all these different, you know, the U.S. election 2016, all these predictions were wrong. Okay. So instead of spending so much time, and this is another way of looking at it, instead of obsession of picking winners and obsessed with making the right choice and without you know, and, 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 you know, that may be possible when things were much more stable and it was more predictive, right? But now you can't. So you've got to play percentages. And the percentages are, and that is really the, the gist of private equity and, and, and then really venture capital is experimentation. Lots of it. Don't be afraid to fail. Learn from failure, right? I think, you know, these days we have to leverage technology, but 
you know, in certain ways, you don't have to know what is going to happen in the future. You don't have to be predictive. Just try to make sure that you have a, um, a, a, a you know, you're making intelligent bets, I guess is the best way to describe it. I don't think all where they may, but some of them are going to hit. Okay, that's what we have to do. All right. Um, I think that's really, really important. Now, that's the new stuff. But, you know, um, one of the things that I realized, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about this, is that, you know, we know certain things do work. And that's what I was talking about, is that the things that we know actually are working, right? Um, that becomes a political issue. And it's one of advocacy, right? And trying to make sure that that, that moves. You don't have to do venture for that stuff. That's, that's pretty well known, right? Um, and it's really getting hearts and minds and it's getting incentive structures set up for people to actually want to do something that they know in fact is the right thing to do. Um, in terms of not for everybody, um, I kind of talked to you about what the limitations were. And like I said, there's still a need for capacity building and campaign advocacy for what we know works. All right. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, the, the, the main thing is that, you know, for an organization to do that, it takes a completely different mindset. And it's, it's, you have to have an organization and the people in our social lives that can deal with uncertainty, um, that can deal with risk and can deal with messiness. Not, not everybody can do that. And if you can't do that, then there are a lot of other areas that you can go. But I, I urge people to think about that. And I also want people to think about the idea of efficiency. If you truly want to do something that's creative, create creative innovation, whatever, that is a messy experience. It is not linear, right? And I think people are obsessed with picking winners, they're also obsessed with being efficient. And you can't do the two. If you're going to be efficient, that is another way of going about things. But in this world, you have to realize that if you're too efficient, you're going to be vulnerable to breakdowns particularly in a certain environment. We saw that with uh, supply chains, right? We got down just in time. Everything was cruising really well. You know, productive was picking up and suddenly COVID hits and everyone is caught flat footed. Okay, so I think that's where we're, that's the kind of world we're in right now. Excellent. So venture is something that uh, philanthropists should look at to see where they can borrow some of those ideas, experiment, realize not everything is going to work, but you have to be willing to learn, learn from those uh, successes as well as the, the failures and be comfortable with that. But also realize once we do know what works, there may be a role for partnerships, collaboration, advocacy. Uh, but um, what impresses me about all of this is that uh, you are a lawyer and generally lawyers are very good at managing risk, but you seem very comfortable with risk. So this is good. This is progress. Yeah, well, that's why I'm no longer a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, one other um, area that you've mentioned, which I think is so relevant at this time, we've had big donors like McKinsey Scott, who've set a new model in place around yeah. trusting people trusting leaders, trust-based philanthropy. But we also know that uh, trust in philanthropic research, we're seeing funders start to lean into models of more yeah. unrestricted funding, uh, allowing organizations to make decisions. And certainly, I think that has been very well received in the sector. But trust requires relationships and building relationships. You have been I'd say excellent at doing this. In fact, I wanted to ask, I saw in your bio that you had worked very closely with Madeleine Albright. I know she uh, was very good at uh, building relationships, especially in diplomacy. Since we have a wide audience that's joining from global organizations, many of them work in fundraising, are uh, learning about this, uh, how do we build trust? How do we build relationships? But also realizing, especially at a global scale, some of this is difficult. Um, technology certainly can be a, both an enabler, but also a barrier. But talk about that also from a fundraising perspective, since we have some folks that are in fundraising that are joining. Um, how can you, what advice do you have for organizations that want to foster those trust fees relationships with their potential donors and funders? And um, what are the challenges that fundraisers are facing in this climate around building trust, building relationships? So lots embedded in that question, but the key thing is 
trust is essential. How do you build trust? And especially working on so many of these global issues, what have you seen um, as both opportunities and challenges at fundraisers face? Yeah. You know, that, that goes on so many different levels. I, you know, I think you're right from a, you know, for those people who are thinking about careers, I think that you put, you, that I, you talked about, I think the ability to develop relationships, to keep relationships and foster relationships is a huge, huge skill. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, off the top of my head, you know, you got to be able to write well, you've got to be able to articulate well, you've got to be able to, you know, these are the, but I think one thing that is not appreciated as much is critical, how critical the ability to build relationships are and everything to work on it, right? So that's at the individual level. I think building trust requires a couple of things. Um, this right combination of one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls, um, that's important, but I also think that there's no substitute for face-to-face, -face. you know? So there is this temptation not to do that and I can understand why, but to build relationships, you gotta meet people in person, all right? And to build a community, which is what trust is about, you have to meet in person. I think another way to go about doing this too is to actually do something together, right? Um, and this is where I, I think that, um, the world is changing too quickly. And I've seen this with younger folks. I've seen it with other uh, older people and more in, in traditional institutions. There's this whole desire to plan everything out, right? To understand where, you know, you should understand strategically the destination, but to plot out how you go and where you go. With the world changing so fast, by the time you do that, that basically becomes irrelevant. So what you have to be able to do is, you know, you have a North Star, but you gotta be able to, to go a circuitous route because you may find something that you had never expected that may actually get to where you wanna be even faster or the destination you thought you wanted actually isn't that. I mean, you think about in the venture side, how many, and even within our work here, how many times we thought we were gonna, this is what we we're trying to accomplish only to find midway through you changed and it's completely different from what you thought you were, you were going to be doing. So in terms of trust, you know, the one thing is it works, right? There are a lot of organizations that are saying, you know, trust us. And, um, you know, to foster that, and as I think about for philanthropy, one thing that people can be doing and kind of off the top of my head is we got it. And this is something that I want, I talked about at the beginning. We, we've got to change mindsets here. We have to change mindsets among funders um, and, and, and high net worth um, individuals too, because, you know, here's the irony, right? Um, and, you know, I translate a lot. And, you know, one of the things that I read that always struck me is that private donors, small, you know, family foundations that are built on business and wealth, that business people who go into philanthropy, and I'm not doing that, I mean, they, they've revolutionized and changed the field, they've created a kind of sense of accountability, which I think is really, really important. But what I thought was really interesting is that these business people that I've worked with take more risk with their job, their, their, their work that they do, than they do in philanthropy, right? Um, I found that a little ironic, right? Because making money and measuring how much money you make is very easy to do, you know, there are clear metrics. Doing what we do with philanthropy is really, really hard and it takes years. So one is the the, the risk adverseness that a someone who's very risk risk oriented becomes very risk adverse to philanthropy. The other thing that I that I've noted in terms of changing mindsets is that when I, as a private sector person, got people to invest in me, they invested in in you know, and this was in private equity and venture capital. In in that environment, you invest with somebody, you have a 10 year relationship with them, right? And over 10 years, you develop a lot of trust. And realistically, five years, you can bail out of a fund if you really want to, but you sign up for this person for 10 years, okay? And that's how much time you give them to make money. But what I have seen constantly is people now these days, um, and philanthropy basically saying, 
to one year. What did you do for me? <laughs> What's your concrete takeaway here, right? So that's the other thing. And finally, what I would say is that the nature of the way, and maybe you don't want them, but for philanthropies and civil society and other ways to get stable and bigger, right? And more so with, with more scale, which I think is important up to a certain point. In the private sector, you always go back for recapitalization, right? You always go back in, in, in my older world, you had a series A, then you went into the market and got more money, series B, D and E, and you got millions of dollars, billions of dollars that get invested, right? There are some foundations that do capacity building, like the larger ones, which are absolutely critical, and they do that. God bless them. But a lot of private funders or smaller foundations, when they have the means to do it, they don't do that kind of thing, right? It, they don't understand that that's the kind, if you want them to get more stable, you've got to throw in some capacity building money, right? And trust them to do the right thing. Wow, that is the, a lot of uh, calls to action there. And I'm just going to summarize patient capital, the idea of playing the long game. 10 years is what we have in, in the business sort of private equity world and funders need to. And this is true of individual donors too. Think about how you can have that uh, patient capital when you support an organization and be willing to stick with them and through that learning phase. And then I also hear a call for more foundational uh, support for organizations, smaller organizations. Uh, we see that long tail of philanthropy in the sense that uh, small organizations often don't get that uh, seed funding, whereas uh, that is critical in those early startup phases. So lots of uh, good insights here. And that leads us, I think we just have a couple more questions and I'm going to be, I'm going to combine sure. the last two and say, you've touched on this, this idea of measurement. Uh, yeah. Philanthropy has been is yeah. part of every culture, every race, every ethnicity, every region of the world that we study. And but the measurement of philanthropy is quite new. The yeah. data driven approach is only, uh, you'd say, maybe in the last few decades that we've seen that. Where uh, are you seeing, especially on the global scale, this idea of measurement and tracking and success? Um, where do you think we should be going as far as measurement? What should, uh, this is true for donors and funders, what kinds of metrics would actually be helpful? And then I will ask you, uh, what gives you hope at this moment? What are you most optimistic about? We talked about all of these challenges that our global uh, societies are facing, our global communities, but there's also, especially if you work in philanthropy, you have an opportunity to see transformation and change and leaders. Um, and I see lots of questions coming in. Please send in your questions. We will have some time to, to have them uh, heard and, and answered. So Philip, um, I know we're running out of time, but I combined those two because I thought those were really good ways of, uh, yes, letting you share your expertise on those. I don't know if I'm gonna have a very satisfying answer, right? You gotta have metrics, but if you rely too many on metrics, we often, um, confuse the map with the actual topography. And if you start focusing on the map too much, you lose sense of what actually is there. Um, and this is what I mean about theory versus um, practicality and doing stuff on the ground. Uh, and that's something I try to keep in mind, you know, all the time. Um, you know, things on a global scale are really hard to measure. Um, so what I would do is if you are committed to um, a long-term relationship to see if something does happen, then from one year one to year 10 or one year one to year five as an interim to year 10, you can actually make a measure of did you seek to accomplish what you wanted to do? You know, here's something radical that I would, I would tell folks um, to think about. And I think this is really, really important. Um, is how many for us when I think about GPF and what we're doing, you know, critical measure for me is how many um, new relationships or what I call strange bedfellows did you create? Okay. Um, when I was at Plowshares, I love to talk about this. I love to talk about strange bedfellows, right? 
we're a plowshares farm. That was the thing, you know, we were a venture philanthropy model. And what we did was that we hooked up a Disney Imagineer um, with a uh, nuclear weapons scientist who studied nuclear arsenals. And they created something that was really very, very cool, right? So I, I, I think one measure of if you're looking at, you know, funders who are looking at different organizations that are investing in people who know things. So one, you invest in people more than anything else, right? Particularly if you're doing this venture or sort of new idea to invest in people. And then you think about how many relationships did you create but for what you're doing right now? If you do that, the percentage will be, percentages will be probably okay. All right. And then my, you know, my hypothesis then is that at the end of this, you're going to find something that is actually that hits. And if it does hit, then it's going to be worthwhile. Um, so uh, in terms of measurements, this is the other thing that I would do to help with measurements, short-term solutions. One is um, I think we got to do more about a, a clearinghouse of failures. Okay, you always hear about successes. You don't hear about failures. And part of that is because a lot of people don't want to talk about that. So again, another mindset of philanthropy, right, is, um, you know, people should be encouraged to fail, right? Not, I mean, you should celebrate that. And that as long as you learn something from it, right? Um, and, you know, there's an organization I thought that I love is, a, I think, the Open Philanthropy Project. You know, they were trying to figure out where they want to invest in areas. They decided not to invest. They did a whole thing, very open, very transparent. Here's what we saw were the advantages. Here are the difficulties. Here are things are failure. I thought that was incredibly helpful. And I think we need to, to do that. And then um, finally, what was it? What gives me hope? Okay. Uh, so those are some ideas that I'm throwing out here. In terms of what gives me hope, um, here's what, you know, people are going to say young people. People are going to say, you know, to me, well, let me tell you the story. So, um, you know, we, ho we have a radio program here at World Affairs. It's on a number of channels all across the country. And we did a story on Afghanistan. And um, I was, you know, on the radio and my kids were, were listening. And then they hear me on the radio, they turn off. And, it's, and I said, why'd you do that, right? And they, and, they, and, and they said, didn't you want to hear what I had to say? Afghanistan is really important. They, you know, they said, you know, it's important, but you can't do anything. If we can't do anything, I'm tired of listening to this. I just don't want to hear anything anymore, right? Because you can't do something. So I, I, I feel like, you know, in this time of COVID, you know, Black Lives Matter, Russia, all these things that are swirling around, the thing that I have noticed is that people are seeking meaning. They're reassessing their lives in certain ways. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's like, am I doing what I really want to do? And more than anything else, I see that um, over the last three years and even now, people are dying to do something. They're dying to, they, are, they, they very much want to act. And so that gives me a lot of hope in terms of what we can do. And in terms of what I see nonprofits, not necessarily philanthropy, but philanthropy can help nonprofits do this, is that our job in the, in the civil society is to get activists, to create activists, all right, um, and create and, 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 and curate opportunities for everyday people to make choices about what they want to do and let them decide the level of engagement that you want, right? And I guarantee you, Again, you play the percentages, you're going to get a number of new activists into the field with a bunch of people who are going to be willing to support whatever is done. That's what gives me hope, right? Um, I'm not focusing, and I think it's going to be all done at the local level. I think that we have to focus on the local stuff because if we wait for governments, we wait for international organizations to do stuff, they're going to be bogged down in planning and politics. Nothing's going to happen. We have to create something from the bottom up and then what we do is we force everybody to start moving in the way that we want them to go. That's what gives me hope. Wonderful. So we have also seen that I can concur from the data side. Um, this has been a period of just many more people around the world who have uh, raised their hands to act in some way around uh, 
supporting those in need, helping their neighbors. And we have several questions, so I'm going to try to sure. condense some of them so that you can at least weigh in on a few of them. One of yes. one question that I'm also quite intrigued by says um, the UN sustainable goals, uh, of course, we all are familiar with them, the very lofty targets set for 2030, which is around the corner, actually, if you can believe it. And it looks like we will fall short. Uh, COVID has set us back on a number of, especially the education and health goals. And you also mentioned population growth. Um, what risks do you think we need to take now uh, around climate, ending poverty, and so many other of the SDGs? And then along those same lines, um, another question came in about India implementing a 2% corporate philanthropy uh, target a few years. This was before COVID. Uh, do you think Western democracies should uh, adopt similar strategies around global and um, domestic philanthropy? So just two questions that we can try to combine. Okay, so I'm not smart enough to know how this is all gonna happen. And I don't claim to know how this is all going to happen. All right, I, maybe the way I will say this is that the UN sustainable goals are very, very ambitious. Um, if they're going to occur, it's only going to be because all of you who are listening and philanthropies in general um, are going to find new partnerships, new ways to do things. And I'm willing to bet on all of you that if you are committed to figuring, you know, to doing something and just trying it, <laughs> right? Try it. And if you do that on a massive scale, something is going to hit, right? And then, and again, we have to realize technology is changing this world very rapidly. So, to to, to if we're going to do that, it is going to also encompass a you know you know Chat GPT four or five whatever we're using quantum mechanic quantum computing. All of these things are going to uh have the ability for us to figure out something if we're going to that's the only way to do it so i don't know i can't answer that question in particular in, in direct and give an answer to that the two, instead of the two percent philanthropy sure why not right but then it becomes all about the politics right and what that means and then you know arguably depending on what kind of society you have and you know the tax you know the, there's that's it's all about the politics there right but um you know People know, like I said, people know what the right thing to do is. The question is, can you create the right incentive system for them to do it, all right? And then can you somehow appeal to their hearts and minds? And my big personal thing is narrative. Narrative about the world, right? Narrative about what the new operating system is going to be. That's my own personal sort of obsession because people are talking about, um, Alternatives to democracy, alternatives to capitalism, you know, these different things. Yeah, you know, people are, philanthropies are doing a lot of great work on that. That's really important. But as I said, the other half of this is that you don't have the platform in order to, to accomplish that or the story to tell. That's where you, it's not going to make any difference at all. And so that's where I think if there was a whole in philanthropy, that's what people need to start funding and thinking about. Okay. Now, that is excellent. And there are several questions that have just come in. So I'm going to try to touch on them and see if you can give us some quick answers. What yeah. is around, you did raise this question, and I, I should have probed further, okay. equity versus justice. Uh, you bring a unique perspective as a trained lawyer. Uh, you said yeah. you are not about equity or all about justice, or at least you think equity doesn't go far enough. Where does equity begin? And um where does or where does equity end and justice begin? Or how do you see uh, these two working together? And that comes from one of my uh, just esteemed colleagues, um, Dr. Patrick Rooney, who's our associate dean here at the Lilly Family School. You know, equity. You know, I'm going to quote. Um, you know, uh, a very good friend uh, and one who I deeply respect, Glenn Gale, Glenn Galich at the. Uh, um, that's the Stubsky Foundation, who's doing a lot of cutting edge things here. But one of the things that we talked about is that equity is a state, right? Justice is actually, um, and, and I think he's right, is an action. It's a verb. It's what we have to do. Um, 
And I think it also has to has to deal with the notion that nonprofits, civil society, others, there's this, uh, you know, a lot of organizations and, and philanthropy, I guess, is obsessed with this notion of nonpartisanship. Okay, and I sort of alluded to this before. You know, nonpartisanship um, doesn't mean you can't have a point of view. And the what I mean more than anything else, we have to have a point of view. This one handism versus the other hand, it ain't gonna work right now, particularly in this time and age. So and that's how I'm starting to think about things is that, you know, justice is action oriented. It's a word, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling, right? And that's what I mean. Equity is sort of, I don't know, it just, it, it, it doesn't push enough. That's the way I look at it. And that's the only thing I can say. And, you know, one of the things I do believe in is that I'm a humanist at heart. Um, I believe in rationality. I believe in metrics. I believe in all those things. But I think that we have lost the whole notion of intuition, um, which I think is important um, and, you know, old ways of doing things. So I, I, that's, that's the only way I can describe it. I should think a little harder about it, um, but you know, and uh, I think I, I should, but uh, I don't have it at this point. We're looking forward to that follow-up article uh, on justice and equity and how those two work together. And happy to collaborate with you on that. So that's uh, that's your homework from the Lily family. Okay. School. <laughs> okay. Now, one last question. I think we have time maybe for one or two more. Okay. I'll try to real fast. still coming in. Yes. So one question, something you've actually pushed for, which is that a lot of, uh, I'd say, challenges we're facing, whether it's on climate, whether it's poverty, require policy shifts, not just philanthropy or philanthropic action. We need both. And, and all three sectors working together is how you've put it. Yeah. But can you talk specifically about how philanthropy can support policy change and support groups working on this? Are there some examples of that? You mentioned marriage equality, but the listener actually sent in... Um, a fund, the Plowshares uh, Plow Fund, supporting yeah. CTBT yeah, and yeah. the Iran nuclear deal. So there's an actual example that came through yeah. from one of our very informed yeah. um, listeners. Well, you see, the, that was a unique circumstance. This is what I mean about um, there are what I love about campaigns and advocacy. There are certain points in the policy process where you can be advocates. And you can, and what's lovely about what's great and easy, quite frankly, is that there's a set time, um, beginning and a set end, and, and an objective, and you can flood money in and get it done, and then you can move on, right? So that's all about advocacy of what I talked about, is organizing, getting people to move in. Uh, you know you know what the solution is? You have, um, you got people who want to act, okay? And you create the mechanism to allow them to act, right? Um, I'm sorry, the question again was, uh, how can I know we're almost out of time? Yeah, yeah. How specifically was how can philanthropy fund policy? But don't worry, um, we you've kind of touched on it. I think you've yeah. answered the question, and yeah. I just we just have a minute left, so I wanted to just use this opportunity once again to thank you, Philip, for such a wonderful insightful and I'd say heartwarming conversation. I feel like I have learned a lot. I've been enlightened and judging from the number of questions we have, lots of other folks have too. I want to thank my colleagues here at the Lilly Family School, LaCoya Gardner, Molly Grimm, and so many others who helped to make this possible. And also our colleagues at the World Affairs Council and at the Global Philanthropy Forum. It's been such a pleasure having this conversation and we look forward to many more opportunities to engage with you. Thank you.